Hello and welcome back to Dev Explaining channel. Today we are going to start something quite exciting. Uh, this is a brainwave series, so I'm going to go through how you can first of all interpret brainwaves, what they are, uh, and uh, then we are going to apply some data science tools uh, to study the brainwaves, uh, actually my brainwaves in this case. And uh, in later parts we will also be uh, using a little bit of Python code uh, to capture those brain waves and then be able to affect real things around us with the power of our mind. Sounds interesting, doesn't it? So if, if you feel like this might be worth your time, stay tuned. We will try di dive a little bit deeper. So this is not going to be Elon Musk's Neuralink, uh, although there are some, some similarities. This is much rougher, rougher thing, but enough to get started on the topic at least. And uh, in today's uh, series, uh, in today's part, we are going to cover the theory behind it. So I think let's get started. Let's dive straight in. Your brain on Python, Project Illithid. First, a disclaimer. I'm not a brain scientist. Uh, this was not a field of study I've ever spent time in, in, in the university. However, uh, it's a hobby for me and it's a passionate hobby. So I've been reading reading on this and, and uh, experimenting with this area a lot. So it's been, it's been fun. But still, if I make any mistakes, there's the comment section below. So please correct me or fill in more details or references if there is something that you feel that uh, should be explained better. Uh, why brains? The reason why I'm doing this uh, series and why I've been doing these kind of experiments uh, is because I've been fascinated with uh, user interface to machines, always, pretty much. So uh, the keyboard and mouse combination, for example, uh, that's actually based, uh, the, the keyboard is based on a type typewriter design, and it was uh, purposefully originally designed to be as slow as possible to write so that the letterheads would not get stuck. But somehow we stubborn people have just kept that uh, user interface all these years and built our kind of own skills around that so expert uh, typists or coders can write at awesome speeds with this interface. But it's not very optimal interface. It's, uh, it, was kind of, it was kind of designed for very different purposes and we just kept it. So uh, today there, there are other possibilities. We have touch interfaces, uh, especially younger people are ve very fond of these and for many purposes, many processes, this just uh, this is what you need and it's very easy. Then we have uh, vir virtual reality, augmented reality, fascinating interfaces. You can, you can see things in 3D and you can interact with things, uh, get some exercise while doing that. I would love to write code in virtual reality, for example, would alter quite a lot my er ergonomics. We have audio interfaces. I love them because they, they are hands-free so you can do so many things by just giving some commands or dictation. And uh, yeah, then we have uh, gesture interfaces. I've been experimenting with those as well. You just do gestures in the air and thereby affect uh, your environment. So very interesting stuff. If you would like to see me do a session on that on Dev Explaining channel, let me know in the comment section and I will, I will then consider because I have a lot of code ready. I would just need to somehow prepare something cohesive on, on what I know of that field. But finally we have the brainwave, uh, mind, mind wave set there. Uh, I have a similar set a bit uh, older and uh, it, it's not very expensive. It's not very precise either. So of, obviously it's not uh, kind of scientific or medical level stuff. It's far from Elon Musk's Neuralink uh, where you would drill a hole in, in skull and tap some electrodes straight into the brain. And these uh, wireless uh, over the scalp type headsets are, uh, they can be affected by electrical impulses. So in that, in that case, uh, there's some hardware software that tries to remove those so that any disturbances are not affecting the result. But obviously you would get much better results if you drill, drill a hole and put electrodes in, inside the brain. And that will also happen. But in my series, we are not going to do that, I think. Uh, yeah, it would be fascinating and fun, fun stuff to do. But let's stick to the theory first. So what are brainwaves? Um, well, brainwaves uh, are actually uh, 
you can think it's communication between neurons. So we, we have electrical pulses that are triggered and then delivered to different areas, uh, activating different areas of the brain. And uh, as uh, research progresses, we learn more and more what areas are activated at, at which uh, kind, of, kind of situations. And uh, we also have a kind of possibility to grab uh, that reading using a sensor on scalp or inside your brain. And then, then uh, you, can, you can divide that raw information to bandwidths that activate uh, on different situations. So uh, we have slow and we have fast brain waves. We have loud, very powerful and, and intense. And then we have subtle and we have functional, very, very kind of straightforward. And then we have complicated. So uh, you can analyze those brain waves and they, they are kind of different things and they are activated upon different thoughts and emotional states. So that's, I think that's very fascinating for me. It combines the data and, and uh, uh, kind of pure, pure functions and then you combine that with human emotions. Uh, yeah, it's a, a symphony of different frequencies. So we have like baseline drums, pads and lead synth. And so somebody is screaming in a weird language on top of all that, I think. How to read the brain. So we, we put the sensors, uh, sensors uh, and, and we start getting data from them. Then we separate them to different brain waves. We need a brain computer interface and they will take care of all this, as I already mentioned. The lower frequency brain waves typically associate with uh, surprise, surprise slowness. So we have tired, slow, sluggish, dreamy meditation. And for higher frequency brain waves typically are activated when you are kind of being hyper alert, concentrated, wired, active. If we drill in a little bit deeper, pun intended, pun intended here, uh, the slowest brain waves are the delta waves and any kind of ranges I give you here are subject to which study you are reading. There is slight differences, but roughly, as I said, the slowest brain waves are within this range and they are typically generated uh, when you are in deepest meditation or dreamless sleep. So uh, you can associate these brain waves activating with healing and regeneration, uh, deep dreamless sleep, non-REM sleep, unconscious. When, when you are really kind of recovering, you are not seeing any dreams. Here is a, one interesting kind of tidbit. I'm using Aura Ring, which you might have seen earlier, uh, to collect the data when I'm sleeping, because I love data. Uh, the data will tell me my heart rate variances and, and my temperature changes um, uh, during the sleep or my kind of movements. And then I get a report of how well I slept and how much regenerative uh, sleep phase I had. So Aura is just doing that with very clever algorithms, but they are not able to directly measure the brains. They are just measuring some side effects and doing some interpretation. Uh, the headset is not very comfy. But if I, if I were able to wear it for overnight, I would actually be able to read this and figure out exactly how much I'm recovering and regenerating each night. Uh, theta waves are the next uh, a little bit faster uh, bandwidth. And, and uh, this would be your intuitiveness, creativeness, recalling, fantasy, imaginary and dream state activating. Uh, that would be your gateway to learning memory and intuition. Um, typically we are in a dream, we are seeing uh, imagination is active, so we are seeing vivid imagery. Uh, there might be intuition and information beyond normal consciousness. So uh, uh, you are still kind of, I think, deep, uh, me good, good meditation is also part of this. So if you like to meditate, uh, you, you are able to reach the deep theta wave. So you are able to activate brain waves in this uh, area. I actually love meditation. It's very very much fun and I've been sometimes measuring that as well. But uh, it's easy to, uh, if, if you have trained your brain a little bit, you can actually probably reach this quite rapidly. I, I would say that I'm able to easily go to, go full on theta activation within a minute just by doing some meditative exercise. Yeah. Uh, funny thing is this also activates when you are doing some ver something very automatic like brushing teeth, driving a car for a long distance. So if you have ever driven a car uh, and, and potentially more than once, uh, then you know that driving a car is not very active state for if you, once you have learned uh, all the controls. So 
you are not doing like okay i need to press the gas pedal five percent to increase the acceleration at this spot and then i then i will use the clutch and then i will be turning left five percent no uh, you are typically just sitting there you start the car you start driving and automation takes over so you're it's so much routine that you just doze off to activating theta, you start meditating and suddenly you notice that one hour has passed without you micromanaging anything and you have driven 100 kilometers and you are far away and you, you have been just zoning off. That's how driving car typically goes. Or coding in Java for me, so I once measured my brainwaves when I was doing Java and surprise, surprise, this was actually a surprise for me. My theta was very active, like meditation, but my uh, more active areas were not so. Java doesn't seem like very activation requiring thing to do for me. Fun, fun thing. I will show it in the next episode. Alpha is the second, uh, second area and uh, it's uh, again a little bit more active. It's the resting state of the brain, so, so I think relaxed is a key word to use here. Not drowsy or not sleepy. You're relaxed, you are present, uh, you are conscious, not quite meditation, but relaxed enough so that you are not concentrated on anything, but you are awake and present and, and uh, relaxed. So a person who has just completed a task and sits down to rest and reflect a little bit lazily is in alpha state, or if you, if you kind of meditate actively or reflect on something, you take a break, um, from a conference and walk in the garden again you are in meditative state or yoga might might get you there so uh, all of the, these activi activities are associated by activating alpha areas then we have beta beta is fun area because if you were really evil uh, corporate uh, kind of uh, emperor what you could do is put uh, for all your employees you can put a headset and you can decide that you want to measure their effectiveness and in this uh, stupid example you are uh, measuring effectiveness as being active as opposed to being creative because you could measure the other areas for that but anyway uh, beta waves act activate when when you are in active conversation decision making problem solving focusing on a task learning a new concept or debating so this is fast activity not just kind of relaxed uh, being awake but here you are alert you are processing things uh, and there is a different kind of sub ranges so we have low beta mid-range beta and high beta that goes from fast idle all the way to high excitement alertness complex thought hyperactive um, word of warning beta is very kind of tiresome so if you are running it for a long period of time it takes tremendous amount of energy so in that sense, uh, you probably have heard me mention Pomodoro earlier, but the effective way to shape your day is not to uh, aim for spending seven and a half hours in, in beta uh, range and being hyperactive all the time. You would be like dead after that. So better way to work is typically to uh, try to have these mini sprints like Pomodoro 25 minute uh, focus sprint. So you take a task then you engage yourself only in it, you get great focus, ac activate activate yourself, enter perhaps a flow state, depending on what you mean by flow state, and you solve the problem, then you take a break, and you get another direction, and you reset your brain a little bit. So uh, beta is the active area, uh, very simple, if, if you want to measure uh, active things, then beta is the, is the one to track. Gamma is then i think this is also a fascinating area for me because it was dis dismissed as spare brain noise originally before it was kind of figured out what it's associated with so gamma is faster than than beta but uh, you would think that uh, faster means that you would be climbing on the on the walls and jumping up and down and being kind of crazy uh, it's not like that so this is more like uh, multitasking and simultaneous processing of uh, information from different brain areas so uh, this is more like uh, reaching higher state of consciousness or universal love or altruism or just in general doing and controlling many things at once so buddhist monks are extremely good at this because they exercise the meditation and focus and concentration and try try to kind of reach that oneness with the universe so when when you are nearing it your gamma will activate 
So fun, very fun, very, very fun area. All together now. This is not very simple field because it's not like just one brainwave state would be activating. Uh, you always have all the areas active, but typically one might be predominant at any given time. So you cannot just say that which area is active, but you can figure out w what is uh, the most active. And you typically activate more than one area together. It's not, there is overlaps. And finally, you typically also uh, swap uh, between the different uh, uh, kind of states immediately and constantly. So there is a lot of fluctuation going on and therefore the math is not going to be extremely simple, but uh, there is some consistency and, and some kind of correlation with what happens outside and what happens in your brain. So we will dive straight into that in the next episode. For now we are nearing the end, so, so uh, i just like to remind you that uh, activate your beta now. If you learned something new today or found this interesting or want to encourage me to do more videos, be active, click the like link if you like the video, share the link for your buddies, at least one, one buddy should be interesting in this one or the upcoming parts. Uh, and uh, remember to subscribe and click the bell icon if you would like to get notifications. Uh, of the upcoming content. All that is very, very, very good thing. And uh, also the comment section, if you would like to give me some uh, guidance on, on what I should do next, everything is very welcome. If you are a better brain scientist than I am and, and you completely can, can kind of uh, steamroll anything I just said, let me know in the comment section. All that is good. I'm here to learn and grow as well. Uh, and uh, but of course disclaimer this was very much simplified and on high level just enough to get us started so uh, if you stayed up until until now thank you a lot in the I, I will do at least two parts more for this so the next part will be about data science analysis tools so we are going to whip out uh, Jupyter notebooks and Python and uh, we are going to record my brain doing different things and then we are going to study that as uh, data from IoT device, which is me. And I'm going to show you some discoveries I've made. It should be rather interesting for you. Uh, remember that all the code is available in GitHub. The link should be in the description of this video and all the other parts. And the third part will then deal with a little bit of Python code and uh, some libraries that I've glued together so that we are able to affect the real world just by altering the brain state. So you don't need to use your fingers on awkward keyboard. You don't need to use your voice even. You can just be like, hmm, and you just snap between different states and something happens. So how cool is that? That's coming up a little bit later. Uh, for now, thanks for listening all this. Uh, I try to keep this short because uh, you, you just learned today that uh, maintaining a learning state like beta active learning active listening is very tiresome. So we are now at 18 minutes mark, almost 20 minutes. It's already quite a long, long uh, moment to try and maintain active learning state. On the other hand, perhaps you were just dozing off and barely conscious while watching this. Hope you had fun and see you next week. Bye bye.